All right, Fact Check This Podcast, episode 28, and today I am going to interview this crazy Canadian, Josh Necker. Josh is one of the Peddling Fiction fans and a group of the Facebook uh, group, or a member of the Facebook group, and he is going to tell us all the joys of living in Canada for everybody that is uh, considering running for a border with the uh, Biden presidency and the Democrats having control of the house and the senate if you're thinking of running for the border you might be going in the wrong direction and josh is going to explain that for us but first he's going to tell us a little bit about how a canadian comes to find libertarianism to begin with josh take it away yeah no kidding hey i don't i still don't know exactly how that happened i mean rothbard i guess rothbard happened and then and then take it from there but uh yeah no it's uh i don't know what to tell you i'm i'm uh i live in winnipeg which is uh kind of the smack dab center of Canada. And uh, yes, it gets really cold here. Although we've, I got to tell you, this year has been like, I can't as a Canadian in good conscience complain about the weather because it's like minus four or something today. Oh, Celsius. Yeah, that means nothing to you. But I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's it's like just barely below freezing. That's all you need to know. Yeah, and normally. Minus, it, minus four is like what? mid 20s, I think for us. Yeah. So, okay. So, okay. So sure. We'll run with that. I'll take your word for it. But it's, uh, this time I swear it was like a few years ago, maybe it's four years ago or something. This time of year, we had like 1500 homes or something like that, where the pipes froze. Um, the, like the water service from the city just froze <laughs> and, and the city could not get out there and thaw them out fast enough. And, and, and there were articles about how we were colder than the surface of Mars and, you know, apparently we take great pride in this. I don't fully get it, but, uh, but yeah. And then this year it's been actually super mild. So yeah, that's, but yeah, here I am. And uh, I'm this strange anomaly of a liberty-minded Canadian. It's, it's funny you bring that up about the weather. I was at a, uh, I was at a conference in, uh, it was actually up around Indianapolis back several, several years ago. And it was in like April and, uh, I, I got hooked up with a bunch of Canadians that were at the conference, and for some reason, they absolutely loved me. And they were like, yeah, you got to come up and go moose hunting sometime. I was like, I'm 6'5", 170 pounds. I'm not really built for moose hunting. They are like, oh, it's not that bad. Today, it's like 40 below up there. I was like, uh, today where I'm from, it's like 70 above. I'm really not built for <laughs> moose hunting. <laughs> like 40, yeah, that, I mean, 40 below, uh, these guys were trying to kill me. Hunters, I mean, I mean, if you can get a moose, then you could be at eighty below. It doesn't matter. You're not, nothing stopping you if you can if you can bag a moose. I mean, that's that's fantastic eats. There, that's a lot of food, man. Yeah, but, uh, maybe I should have yeah, taken no, up on it. I I, I don't. Uh, I wouldn't be venturing out at minus forty myself. I uh, I I grow. I've grown up in this in this weather. I suppose I can take it, but I just don't want to. You know, who who needs that? Fair enough. All right, so I, I want to start with the uh, a favorite topic amongst many uh, more socialist-minded folks when uh, talking about Canada and the wonders of Canada. Tell us about the uh, universal health care situation you got going on <laughs> up there, especially, especially with COVID going on and you getting to have some personal experience with that here over the past couple of days that you've told me about. So... Tell us the, the joys of universal health care in Canada. Boy, you are just jumping into the thing that's going to get me the most the most uh, uh, outrage. Uh, <laughs> we, can tell you. we can talk about guns no, first. If you no, 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 no. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you. Well, there you go. That's number two, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, that's the, that's the first thing that comes up anytime you're talking to an American as a Canadian is, so you get that universal health care thing. And and let me tell you, it is like it is the, the the it is the golden calf in Canada, right? It's the it's that it's the sacred cow that you just cannot speak ill of um, for an awful lot of people. But uh, I mean, like anything, it's got you know. Don't get me wrong; there there's obviously upsides, right? Like there's obviously going to be upsides, and and uh, you know, it, people don't go bankrupt here because of a medical problem, generally, you know. Uh, most things are gonna be covered and it's, it's very rare that somebody 
no, no, nobody gets a, uh, has a heart attack and then loses their house because they can't afford to pay for it. So like, I mean, like if we're being serious and, and obviously, you know, no one who I'm talking to here, uh, I don't have to explain to you that, that like, yeah, that doesn't make it morally right. And we can get into the, you know, the morality stuff and, and, and brother, I'm with you, you know, obviously, but I mean, if you're talking to your average person, that's obviously an upside. Like they view that as an upside, right? And and trying to have the conversation that robbing other people to pay for someone else's healthcare, like you just can't even have that conversation. Like you just, like not here. It's it's very rare you're going to find somebody who will even entertain that conversation because it's like, that's what I mean by it's the golden calf, you know? You cannot, you can't uh, besmirch the, uh, the, the, the great uh, universal healthcare of Canada. But that being said, I mean, it ain't perfect, obviously, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you can tell me what your experiences are, but I, I had to go to the hospital a few months back with for a gallbladder attack. And I don't, have you ever had a gallbladder attack? No. It's, it's well, I, I mean, I can only speak from personal experience, but I can tell you it's about the worst pain I've ever experienced. And it's like, it just, it just doesn't stop. There's no, there's no comfortable position you can be in. There's not, there's nothing you can do. And other than just, ride it out or you go to the hospital and eventually they give you really good drugs and you sleep it off like that's it that's that's what they can do for you you know is is give you something for pain and let you sleep it off but uh and I, it wasn't even like a it was it, i don't remember what day of the week it was it was like a monday night or tuesday night or something it wasn't even like a friday night where you think okay clearly the uh the emergency rooms are going to be jam-packed because you know people are out being hooligans on a friday night but this was like it was a monday or tuesday or something and i was there for six and a half hours i think before i actually got to see a doctor and that's that's kind of normal you know like it's maybe it's a little on the high side but it's that like you know i mean obviously if i if i if i went into the hospital and my arm was cut off i'll see somebody right away but like if you're not if you're not in a you know immediate risk of dying then you go bleed over there you know and and wait your turn so that's that's definitely an, an experience and then of course with the covid stuff i mean well and you i okay i know again who because of who i'm talking to i don't have to explain this but you know i don't know who's listening so um i mean you know that with any scarce good the the i mean price becomes the thing that that we use to determine distribution of it right like that's that's how you determine who gets what is is well the price goes up, then fewer people and the demand goes down, right? But when you have a universal system, there is nothing that controls demand, clearly because you're not paying a price, right? right? So then the only thing that you can do is control supply. That's because other I mean you can either throw a bottomless pit of money into it or you can control supply, and we kind of do both because we do throw bottomless pits of money. It seems to me. I remember year, reading years ago, and this is not a not exactly a recent number, but I don't imagine it being wildly different from what it was 15 years ago. But I remember reading years ago that it, 43 cents on every federal tax dollar was it, was it federal tax dollar? No, maybe it was just tax dollar in general. 43 cents, I think, goes to pay for our health care. It's something like that. I don't know, but it is a significant amount of money that's that we're taxed that just goes directly into health care. But it's still never going to be enough, right? Like you just can't throw, it's, that's one of those things you can't just, there's no amount of money that you can throw at it and then say, okay, we're good now. Like it just, it doesn't work like that, right? And- uh, Right, the more money you yeah, so, throw at it, the more the more you throw at it, the more people are going to use it and the more that it's going to require. And it, it's yeah. just an endless cycle of- the, the, uh, the, the great example that I have for that is when I was, I guess, probably about 20 years old or something. It was the first time that I was legally eligible to vote in a provincial election. So I think I would have been about 20 years old and I was not, I, I back then I would have probably, um, I would have described myself as like a small C conservative, right? So not necessarily an, uh, you know, a, a, a fan of the conservative party specifically, but just, you know, relatively conservative in values. And largely that, that had to do more so with economics. I just, I just have always felt like government's too big and they spend too much money. And hey, these guys over here seem to talk about smaller government and spending less money. And 
lower taxes. And hey, yeah, sounds good to me, right? That that made sense. But uh, we had we had had a conservative government up until that point, and and the and the um, like the the most sort of socialist party we have is the NDP here, which is the New Democratic Party. Maybe it's not the most because now we have the Green Party, and now that's a race to you know a, a race to the bottom, as far as I'm concerned. But but the the NDP is sort of a major. Uh, um, one of the major parties, and certainly in my province, for for as long as I can remember, we just go we flip back every few years between conservative and NDP, right? New Democratic Party, which is, you know, the the the, the working man's party, or the, well, they wouldn't say that anymore, but you know, it's like sort of the that's all the unions always support the NDP. I mean, you can kind of get the picture, right? Um, but the NDP, the 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 candidate uh, was he ran on. He was going to end hallway medicine in six months, and he was going to cut the wait times for MRIs, because these were both, you know, obviously hot button issues in that particular election cycle. Uh, we had long wait times, uh, particularly long wait times for MRIs. At the time, it was, I think, 11 weeks that you had to wait if you wanted an MRI. And I, I might have these numbers slightly off, but I'm not going to be off by far, because this is a lot of years ago, but it was something very, very close to this. Uh, I think it was 11 weeks. And, and he promised that, that, you know, elect me and, and, and in six months, we're going to end hallway medicine. We're going to cut down uh, wait times on, on MRIs. And so then they did get elected. And the thing that I remember the most was that they bought three new MRI. But at the time, our province only had one MRI machine in the province. That, there was only the one. And they bought, I think it was three more, or, or maybe they bought two more to go to three. Either way, they bought new MRI machines. And then like by six months to a year later, our wait time was suddenly 19 weeks, not 11. And it's like, well, what happened? I mean, they, bought, they, they, they increased the supply, right? How did this happen? And the answer was twofold. First of all, they, they, they got to have their ribbon cutting ceremony showing off the MRI machines. But from what I gathered, what they didn't do was actually have more technicians to operate the MRI machines. So a lot of these machines were sitting like dormant for a lot of the time because they didn't have the technicians to run them. And then the problem is it's well, so much worse than that because, because at, if, if that was the only problem, then the wait time would have just stayed the same, right? It wouldn't have gotten worse. Right. But because they had these big ribbon cutting ceremonies, what they did is they signaled to the market, in this case, a market of doctors, hey, we got more capacity on MRIs. So doctors started sending people for MRIs more because, hey, why not? We have more capacity. So, I mean, this is just an example of how bad government is at, at managing anything, right? They're always bad at managing anything. But, like, they, I mean, they spent a ton of money and the problem got worse, right? Like, it didn't get better. It got worse. And that's just, I mean, that's government. That's the way that goes. Well, you know? I mean, that's, yeah, like you said, that's government. I mean, government's really not incentivized to actually do anything to solve a problem or be successful if they... Uh, they they actually have a higher incentive to fail because if they completely fuck that up and it creates a higher wait time, then that means next time around they get to campaign on spending even more money so they can get more techs and they can get more MRI machines so that they can fuck and, it up. And don't again. don't forget more ribbon cutting ceremonies. Those yes. are important. Yes. Those ribbons are not going to cut themselves, you know. That's right. That's the most important part. If you can't get up there in front of a camera and cut some shit and make everybody see how important you are and how good a, a job you did, then it doesn't even matter. Like there's, there's no, no but it's, point. It's not it even, didn't even it's happen. It's not even worth case. doing. Yeah, exactly. It's not even worth doing. And then, okay, so that, I mean, I'm telling a story from years ago just because it, it was pretty hyper relevant, I think. But, uh, but like even through all this with this COVID stuff, uh, when we were you know, being told that like, hey, we're like almost out of capacity or we're, or we're, we're at capacity in our ICU beds. And like, like this is serious. We got to, and you got to remember the public, there's a lot of public policy being made on these, on these factors. Right. And like, well, we'll get into it, but like, we're, we're in serious lockdown and we've been in lockdown for weeks and weeks and weeks now. Right. Um, but I mean, this is even before the, 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 the really heavy lockdowns when they were saying, oh, we're out of capacity, we're out of capacity. And this is a big deal. And I, I finally was like, I, I wonder how many ICU beds we have. Like, like that seems like, that seems like something I can find. So I started googling, and um, you know, we have the it's the, called the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, right? And so all the the hospitals within Winnipeg are kind of fall under the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. And so I found myself very quickly on the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority site, and and, and lo and behold, 
I found that number. And keep in mind that Winnipeg's got, I don't know, it's around 800,000 people. So we're like a kind of, you know, mid-sized city. We're, we're, uh, we're either a, a big little city or a little big city, depending on how you look at it, right? But 800,000 is not nothing. You know, it's a, that's a, you know, fair sized city. We've got three major hospitals and then, and then um, a few smaller ones, you know. Um, I think it's, I'd have to count them up, but I think it's probably six hospitals in, in total. And, and, and it depends on what you call a hospital because it's super controversial that our current uh, provincial premier just uh, converted some of our emergencies to urgent cares, which is, you know, just means something different in their world in terms of, uh, of, of what that means and what services are available. And so, but you know, like we've got like, it's, it's something in the order of like six hospitals in total, three major hospitals. And so with 800,000 people, I mean, you take a guess, Justin, how, how many ICU beds across, across all those hospitals do you think we have to service 800,000 people? Throw a number. I'm just curious. I mean, 80,000, maybe 50,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. 58. 58? 58. You were close. <laughs> Missed it by that much. 58. We had 58 ICU beds. And I was like, I, I just, I couldn't, I'm like, what? We have 800,000 people in the city, and you're telling me that only 58 can be, I mean, sick enough to need an ICU bed? What? Like, that didn't make any sense to me at all. But again, it does make sense when you consider that when you have nothing to control the demand side, all you can do is ration the supply side. That's, that's, how, that's how it's always going to work. Well, we've had the, a similar thing here in the U.S. that a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the ICUs being at capacity, at capacity, all of this stuff. And I saw it a, a week or so ago. There was actually a statistical analysis done of 2020 versus 2016, 17, 18, and 19. And ICU uh, occupation for 2020 for the year was actually lower than in 16, 17, 18, or 19. Like the, the way the hospital systems here are built is they are designed to always run at capacity. Like there's always been a nurse shortage. It wasn't due to COVID that there was an, a shortage of nurses. Like that's always been the case. All of these hospitals always run to the bare bone minimum amount of staff they always have the minimum amount of beds that they can get away with like, it's just the way that the system is is set up even here and so oh, i hear you so the I, way I, that I, they, I, the way they put these numbers together and they presented it sounds like it's this you know world ending health catastrophe when in reality if you look at it in perspective it's just an it's a normal year well, and just to be clear, like, I, I know I'm kind of dumping on our, our, our uh, socialized healthcare system here, and, and, it's, I, and I believe all of it. Like, I, I think it's dump worthy, you know. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you bring this kind of conversation up with a, a Canadian, it's been my experience nine times out of ten, the first place they go is like, well, like, how should it be? Like, they have it in the, in the, in the U.S.? Like, is that what you want? And, and my answer is always, no, this is not a dichotomy. It's not this or that. And those are our only options. And like, you know, from, from, from what I gather, at least from, I don't, I don't know that I have a really full and deep understanding of your healthcare system, but I, I probably know more about your healthcare system than your average American knows about anything in Canada. Cause you know, we are always watching you guys and most of you guys just don't really, you just, we're just those weird people up North that live in the cold to you guys. I get it. So um, but I'll, I'll tell you, I think that you guys have like the worst of both worlds because you don't have a free, uh, free market of, of healthcare. Like that's like what you have cannot possibly be described as a free market of healthcare, but you also don't have a single payer system. So like there's lots of countries in the world that don't have universal healthcare and don't have people bankrupted over a heart attack like right. that can happen it can be done you know it's not it's not an either or you know and uh 
Yeah, ours that definitely makes- isn't. Ours definitely isn't ideal. Like, there's still a lot of major issues with the way our healthcare system is set up. And with all of that being said, like, I don't think single payer is the solution. Like, there's there's got to be another solution to it. But you know, like you were talking about waiting six and a half hours or whatever uh, when you went to the hospital. So uh, a couple months ago, my son thought he was having uh, he'd had a hernia previously, and so he was having some. Uh, pains and he thought he was having a he thought he had a hernia again and uh we went to the doc or we went to the hospital and I think we sat in the waiting room at the hospital for 35 minutes maybe and then they got him to the back of the doctor came around they checked him out they took a urine sample went and had some x-rays done like all in all we were probably at the hospital for three and a half hours maybe four hours which to me seemed like it was taking forever, but you know, for for you to oh, sit and wait no, no. for six and a half hours just that to was six and a half hours. I was there for thirty hours, but see, but, that's... but I mean, I, I was six and a half hours before I even got to see a doctor. Yeah, that was just sitting in a waiting room. That's fucking insane. Like, that's still I... the only time I've I've worn a mask for that long because I had to wear a mask obviously the entire time I was in the building, right, and. Uh, God, that kind of sucks. I, I mean, I, I feel bad for the people who are who have to wear a mask at their work because, I mean, I, I also have to wear a mask when I work, but my work is very different. And I'm, I, you know, it's, it's rarely is it for more than 30 to 40 minutes, maybe an hour at most that I'm in an appointment and then, and then I'm out. But like people who've got to wear a mask all day long, I don't know. It's, it's unpleasant, you know, but what are you gonna do? Yeah. Uh, so I work in retail and uh, we are, it is now part of the dress code. We have to wear the mask anytime we're in the building. And uh, man, it's when I had, I had a little bit of a head cold uh, a couple weeks ago and I got, I got one of the like um, idiot looking face shields because the mask was making me sicker than what I was just being sick. <laughs> like it was yeah. I, my, my poor wife, uh, she she will wear the mask because we're supposed to, and she's not uh, a big rock the boat type of person. But since they put in the the mask requirements, she has had more problems with her breathing, with getting sinus infections, with getting sick. Like she had she had gone for a long time where that was not a problem at all. Hey, in a previous job the they used like chemicals and stuff and the chemicals she had sinus infections and stuff all the time and when she got out of that job and moved to to what she's doing currently she stopped having all of those problems like it just all went away and then oh. and then when the mask mandates came around it all came back it's like uh. they are actively hurting people with all these mask mandates and they're not even necessary I, evan uh when i talked to him a couple weeks ago like he went into he he has researched a whole bunch on that stuff. And I, I, I listen to a whole bunch of stuff and read a whole bunch of stuff with research on it. And like, there is absolutely nothing that shows that masks are useful in any way. Well, the big takeaway is that despite, for me anyways, is despite being repeatedly told for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, trust the science, trust the science. It is unbelievable to me how much public policy just seems to be like, created out of thin air you know i mean i again like the, the i might be a little extra bitter right now because we've been locked down since oh man i don't know i think in october sometime i don't i don't even remember it this it's it's actually it might have been november 8th but i feel like maybe it was earlier than that i don't know i because we it, it's hard to remember because we went to like code orange and code orange had you know, certain restrictions. And, and then and then when we went to Code Red, and I think maybe that was November 8th, that kind of sticks out in my head. But it was going to be, you know, okay, we're going to do four weeks of of, uh, of Code Red. And then, and then so yeah, that's right. Because then that brought us to December 8th. And then they came out and said, oh yeah, no, we're doing this till January 8th, which meant through Christmas, right? Which, and again, this is as restrictive as I can imagine it being. Um, you cannot have anybody to your home that doesn't live there simple as that now that's christmas right no family over for christmas none of that there's you know 
they made a couple minor exceptions for uh, if somebody lives alone, they can have they can have a person come over. Um, How but, nice! Uh, to allow yeah. Person, um, make yeah. 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 That's, that's right. You know. They're, they're, so I mean, I've I've had a, a standing, uh, you know, standing plans every week with a, with a buddy because he does live alone, and so every Wednesday. I'm out hanging with him and, you know, we both, we we're both musicians. So we, you know, play some music, we order in some food, you know, maybe listen to some music, have a chat. Like it's, you know, we, we hang out for hours, you know, every week. And like, it's, I mean, and I, and I love it. I mean, I quite enjoy it, but it's like, part of me is like, how, how sad is it that like, you have no idea how much I end up looking forward to that Wednesday, you know, just because it's like, oh my God, that feels si kind of normal. You're going out to a friend's and hanging out and that kind of feels a little normal. You but man, actually, we got you have to actually see somebody that's not a immediate family member that you have to spend every day with anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's you know, we've got uh, every restaurant is closed, every bar is closed. Retail is more or less closed, other than for what they have deemed essential. I mean, you know, what what they have deemed essential, right? They they I mean, just the, the, the hubris of thinking that you can determine what is essential to somebody and what isn't is just maddening to me. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, they, so our grocery stores are still open because, you know, that's essential. And our hardware stores are still open because apparently construction is still essential. I mean, that makes sense. You know, I, I mean, I, as you know, I'm a realtor, so um, we're deemed essential because people got to live someplace, you know, and, and not everybody gets to choose when they buy or sell a home. Sometimes life changes, make those choices for them, you know? Right. And so, so, you know, we're, we're essential workers, but I just, I even hate, just, I don't know if you just noticed, but I even hesitated to say that because I hate using the term essential worker about myself because it just, it, like, it makes it sound like I think my job is more important than somebody else's who's sitting at home. And I, I don't like, that's just not, that's 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 obscene to me that like that that somebody has decided that okay well my job is okay but that guy's job no it doesn't matter what he loses he's out you know oh, I agree. because somebody deemed it not essential i agree wholeheartedly because i was uh so we work at at lowe's which is you know home improvement and all that stuff and so we're essential and it pissed me off so much especially early on but even, you know, has continued to piss me off because a lot of the people coming in aren't buying essential stuff. Like people built decks. Shit, I built a deck, you know, it's like they're not, uh, it's not that their refrigerator went out or their washer or dryer went out or, you know, they're having to patch a hole in the roof. Like, well, of course, they, of course they built a deck because they're sitting at home because they can't go to work. What the hell else are you going to do? Exactly. And like <laughs> so everybody was just coming in and, doing all these home improvement projects and stuff none of it was legitimately essential it was all just to have something to do because otherwise they were stuck at home i was trying i was thinking the other day, i was having a very serious thought the other day about if i could research if there's actually a way to do like like what is there is there a legitimate like like reliable way to do building products like like you know building materials out of cardboard like, like, there's got to be somebody's figured out how to build like walls and stuff out of compressed cardboard or something. And I was thinking, you know, I think I'd like to build myself a new garage out of Amazon boxes because I'm pretty sure I can do it pretty soon. <laughs> I think you just, it's, I it's, you just need the right type of adhesive and you could probably make it happen. <laughs> there's got to be some technique out there that, that to, to build it. Maybe not a whole garage. Maybe I could just build a garden shed or something, but, uh, but yeah, because you can't go shop anywhere. I can't. I mean, there are some places that are open. Like you can go to Walmart, right? And you think, oh well, if you can go to Walmart, then everything's fine. No, 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 no. Because everything is, of course, roped off. You can only buy the essential items when you're at Walmart. And and uh, and again, some of the stuff that they've de deemed to be essential versus non-essential just makes you scratch your head. But you know, whatever. This is this is where we are. And and then uh, there just is not a spirit of. There's not a big enough spirit of, of like rebellion against against the government here. This is not that's not the mind of a typical Canadian, you know. I, in fact, here let me that's let me give you I'll give you a, because I wanted I wanted you to explain how that works because you know Americans we're all a bunch of fucking cowboys with our guns and uh, you know we're ready to go shoot shit up and and 
you know, we're, we're always just on the verge of the next revolution, or at least some of us are, uh, or at least that's the perception that we get from, you know, around the globe a lot of times. But, uh, you know, Canadians are, and the, the American perception of Canadians is that y'all are all just like super nice and polite and apologize for everything all the time. And, you know, uh, maple syrup and well, hockey. It's... So, so most, most Canadians, I mean, it's always hard to like speak in broad brushstrokes, right? Because of course there's going to be a, a obvious exception, but I would say your average Canadian will on one hand they'll acknowledge and they'll bitch like the rest of us you know they'll, they'll they'll acknowledge that that government is wasteful and sometimes incompetent and that and they'll acknowledge that politicians are often corrupt they're more interested in lining their own pockets or you know you know just you know brokering in power than so they'll acknowledge all of those failings and yet simultaneously i would say most canadians trust the government they don't trust them to get it like a hundred percent right but they don't distrust them they don't they don't distrust the the intention most of the time it's like the, there's a difference between an individual politician and the government in their mind you know it's like yeah that politician could be crooked but the government is is here for the people right like that's the that's the idea and i'll give you an example when i say i because i had man i had to laugh I, I and you're gonna laugh at this too because you're I promise you, you'll see the, 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 you'll appreciate the humor in this. Somebody sent me a link to a Facebook event, you know, an event on Facebook. And it was, somebody was organizing like a rally against the lockdowns. And, and, and the write-up was like, was really like, um, you know, you could tell the person was pissed off. They're like, you know, like I've had enough of this and this is not right. And locking all this down. And they make this really strong argument for how terrible this is. And they're saying, so come on out show your support let's get out there we're going to stand in front of our legislative building or it's our provincial building a provincial government building right stand in front of our legislative building we're going to let them know that that this is not okay and enough is enough and blah 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 and uh it, they scheduled it for january 23rd which is a ways off right and and it occurred to me that i'm i'm fairly sure that the reason they scheduled it for january 23rd is because our current lockdowns that don't allow such a gathering end on the 22nd. So, so they're trying to round up people to go out and protest the lockdowns. So they booked it for the day after the current lockdown ends. That's the, that's the spirit of rebellion that we have. You can't go protest the lockdowns when you're still being locked down. You got to wait until after the <laughs> lockdown ends to protest I, the lockdown. Y'all are so I lucky. knew you would appreciate that. <laughs> that is so obedient of them to to wait until the lockdown ends to, to protest the lockdown <laughs> yeah no kidding it's just i and i just i i that that's it like that what do you say to that like no no i'm not gonna go to that like it's like, like, like the come most on. This polite is, thing ever it's like exactly this is this is this is what we've got for civil disobedience here Oh, we are all screwed, man. But see, I don't like, want to say too much and like spoil it because there's going to be a couple interviews come out here over the next couple of weeks that really get into it. But there was a guy here in the U.S. that sued his state and like he uh, over the lockdowns and stuff. Like he sued his state because of the lockdowns and got it all the way up to a federal court, I believe. Um, and at the time that it finally got dismissed from the federal court, he could have appealed, but it was set the lockdown was set to expire anyway. And so he was like, there's no sense in appealing it because by the time we got a solution, it would already be over with anyway. But, you know, he was like, he was fighting it tooth and nail every step of the way. <laughs> like, so he, he took the opposite approach. Like he, he was trying to fight it and realized a after it's ended, there's no point in continuing to fight. <laughs> well, I did see an article this morning about a local tattoo shop that has basically decided to thumb its nose um, you know, at, at the, and, and they just went ahead and reopened. Um, and I mean, they made, I think, a pretty valid argument. They what said, like, the, like, a, what's the enforcement like on that? Because we have had here in the states a lot of sheriff's departments and uh, police officers and stuff say that they will not enforce 
they won't enforce the lockdowns. They won't enforce the mandates that the stuff is that it's unfair and it's unconstitutional. And so like law enforcement officials have said, I'm not going to participate in that. What's the, uh, what's the enforcement like? So, so early on, like we're talking about back in the spring, there was a period of time in that first lockdown. And, and, and I think probably for a short while after, as I recall, there was a period in time where the Winnipeg police had taken the position that they were not going to be enforcing lockdown measures that, that that was not their purview and they weren't going to be doing it but i don't think my impression was that it it was not out of any sense of this is wrong and therefore we won't enforce it you know this was not standing up to an injustice best i could tell this was there's always a tug of war between who has to pay for what we've got three levels of government right you got your municipal government we've got our provincial government we've got our, our federal government and, and it's, it tends to be very delineated in terms of who's responsible for what, but there's always going to be little bits of overlap. And it honestly felt more like a push-pull between the city saying, no, they weren't going to do it because they didn't want to spend the money and they didn't have the budget for it, right? And, and admittedly, the city is the one where they're, they're more bound to their budget than, I mean, the province can issue bonds, right? But the city can't. So they they have to stay a little bit they, they have to be a little bit more frugal and so uh, or at least um they're not they're nothing but frugal jesus christ did i just say that out loud i just mean they have they, they have to stick within their budget um and then basically go with the tin cup to the province and to the to the, to the country like to the federal government you know constantly asking for more money but you know, or they raise taxes and you can only do so much of that and blah 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 but anyways bottom line is i feel like the the police when they took that position early on, it really, I think, had more to do with, like, this is not our baby to have to pay for, right? I don't, I certainly didn't get any impression that this was, you know, that they had taken the position that these were, you know, unconstitutional edicts or anything like that. Um, but that only lasted a short time. And then they did an absolute about face. And now they are absolutely enforcing it. Um, if I had to guess, and I, I'm whole, I could be completely making this up, but if I had to guess, it feels like there was a backroom deal where the province said, listen, you can enforce this and you guys get to keep the revenue. And they went, we're in, you know, like <laughs> that'd be my guess, you know, but, but the, uh, the enforcement pretty severe. Like they, there are for an individual, not when I'm, we're not talking about business, but for an individual, uh, if you're caught violating any of the, uh, edicts, I think it's like a $1,300 fine. Right. Um, so it's, it's not nothing like it's, it's significant, you know, um, and then a business, I think it's a minimum of $5,000 a day rings a bell. Um, and obviously it can go way, way up from there. So, um, they don't necessarily have to, um, you know, show up like jackboots. They can literally just show up with their, their ticket book and wreck you, you know? And, and, and I guess the nice thing is it's less violent, but you know, it's still wrecking you. So I don't know. But yeah, the, the enforcement is, is fairly, fairly severe, you know. I mean, I, I can already, I can hear some of my Facebook friends screaming that like, it's not severe enough because people are still having parties, those stupid people. And, you know, the, the one thing that the government has done, and I, 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 this is probably all over. I can't imagine that this is a, a phenomenon that's unique to here, but they have done a remarkably good job of, blaming the additional lockdowns on people not following their rules and turning people against each other, right? So it's like, you have to be locked down for another four weeks because your neighbor isn't following the rules. And so you got to call. If your neighbor's not following the rules, you got to call. You got you to gotta tell somebody or else you're just going to be locked down forever if you, if you keep letting them do it. So they, they really are, are working hard. To, and, and, and I'll tell you, that's not, that's not only COVID. There was, there was just recently, they, they've been doing a... Uh, an ad campaign encouraging people to uh, to turn in their neighbors if if they like basically what to watch for for contraband cigarettes. What right? contraband cigarettes? Cigarettes. Contraband cigarettes are cigarettes that came from out of province and didn't have the taxes paid on them. Right. So so there are um, there's, there's a few different situations, but we've got our. our um, I know that one of the issues around the cigarettes thing is, is we have uh, some of our, our um, Aboriginal bands have the right to grow and manufacture their own cigarettes, right? I'm, I'm, 
I, for all I know, maybe all of them do. It would make sense that it wouldn't be just some of them. I know that. But there are. What's that? I said I know that from Letterkenny. Oh yeah, okay. So so you've got the uh, I've never watched Letterkenny. I never have. I, this is, people tell me you might not appreciate I, it like I do. I don't know. I, you know what? I might. I, it's, you're not the first person to bring it up. I probably should watch it. But uh, but yeah, they, it, it, like so. Then there's this whole business where people are smuggling in cigarettes that come from from one of the bands, and they're bringing them into the province illegally. And then you know people are buying up cheap cigarettes, and you can't have that. And uh, because then you know the province doesn't get to tax the cigarettes, so. So that's just, an, uh, you know, can't do that. So, so now they're actually running campaigns telling people to snitch on their neighbor if they, if they suspect somebody is, uh, is, is, you know, buying or dealing in contraband cigarettes. Like, so, so the, the turn on your neighbor thing runs pretty deep here, you know, and, and it didn't always. Like, that seems to be a relatively recent phenomenon and, and not a, it's very discouraging. You know, I mean, it's a big reason I want to get the hell out of the city between that kind of attitude and then the fact that, that we have unequivocally turned our Winnipeg Police Department into the revenue generating arm for the city. Like the way that we have taken to traffic enforcement and ticketing, we've got photo radar is insane. Like it's everywhere here. And, uh, and then just, just like uh, aggressive ticketing. It's really like we got a lot of aggressive ticketing here that uh, makes it kind of unpleasant. Now, that being said, here I am dumping all over my city, right? And like, eh, it's, if you can set that stuff aside, like it's one of the best places in Canada in terms of like, like housing pricing is amazing here compared to any major city, right? And, and so it's like, it's got its good stuff, but it's just, it's just whatever government touches. That's, I mean, not, perhaps not surprisingly, that's where we go wrong. So whatever government touches is just it's just a walking shitstorm. But you know, and y'all housing are, prices are great. Y'all are borderline totalitarian, so government pretty much touches everything. Yeah. I mean, for somebody like 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 you and I, like somebody with our sort of moral philosophy and sensibilities, it yeah, it's a little tricky. You know, uh, it's funny through all this COVID stuff. You know, you know, people reach out to me that I haven't talked to in a while because nowadays you're not talking to a lot of people. You know, for a while, and. Uh, my answer has been like, it's like, how are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, all things considered, I suppose I'm fine. Um, but, you know, imagine what it would be like if you hated the government and believed that they were an evil institution and then they told you you couldn't leave your house. And that's kind of how I just spell it out to people. Imagine, imagine that you thought that way. Because I know you don't, but imagine you did and then the government told you you couldn't leave your house. You know, and, and uh, yeah, that's that's what it's like. So how did you, that, that's actually a good segue. How did you find like peddling fiction and some of the other uh, like libertarian type stuff to, to kind of give you that outlet for, uh, for meeting some people like me and all of us other crazy cowboy Americans that uh, hate the government? And... So, okay. Um... I mean, I, and like, I probably, not probably, I definitively had that sort of spark in me. And I would say it goes back to like, you know, young, like, 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 uh, I think I probably read Fahrenheit 451 when I was, I can't imagine 12 or something like that, you know, and then, you know, 1984 as a youngish teenager and Atlas Shrugged and, you know, like just those kind of sort of important works, um, important works of fiction. So that kind of gave me that spark for sure. But honestly, I, like I told you, you know, back in my 20s, I would have referred to myself as a small C conservative. And I couldn't have even, I probably didn't even know the term libertarian. I bet you, I don't think I even heard the term libertarian until 2008, Ron Paul. And like, I mean, I'm Canadian. It's like, that's your, that's your politics down there. But, you know, the, the, don't think we ain't watching it. You know, we, like it's, it's, it's entertainment for a lot of us, you know, especially lately. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, but I, you know, I saw a couple of videos of Ron Paul talking and thought, man, this, this crazy old shit has got his, he's got to figure it out. You know, like he's, he's just, uh, he seems a little, you know, a little kooky, nice, seems like a sweetheart guy. 
but he seems a little kooky, but everything he says, I can't argue with, you know? And, and, and so definitely it would have been that. And then the next thing, you know, what's funny is that after the 2009 kind of, you know, financial implosion, I, I was flying out to Ottawa for some business. And, uh, as I tend to do, I pretty much always just buy a book at the airport, right? Like I'll just pick up a book off the shelf and be like, okay, this is what I'm reading on the flight. And quite accidentally, as it turns out, I bought Meltdown by Tom Woods. And I had no idea who Tom Woods was. And I just, it was a, I was on a topic I was interested in and I read it and it blew me away. And I was like, oh my God, this guy really, I was, I was so impressed with that book and then got completely distracted and forgot all about it after that. I was, you know, and, and, and moved on with my life. And then somewhere along the way, I guess it was probably through crypto. Because then around 2012-ish, I started sort of poking my nose into crypto. And, 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 uh, and then the idea of decentralization just sort of inherently lends itself to libertarianism, I believe. And, uh, and so then, you know, when, when you get into the crypto world, I mean, you, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to start bumping into some libertarian thought, you know, and the deeper you go into, into the crypto world, the more you're going to get to sort of understand that. And then along the way, then i then I rediscovered Tom Woods and, and, uh, discovered, uh, Dave Smith early on, you know, part of the problem back in the Mike Brincatelli days. I don't know. Were you listening to Dave Smith, Smith back when he was? Mike Brincatelli? I, I just this year really got into podcasts. Oh, okay. So. okay. Yeah. Well, that was, that was uh, like part of the problem became like a go to for me for a long time. So did Jason Stapleton. I, I that show changed and, and, and I, I left. I, I kind of dropped off, you know, when, when he, uh, he sort of changed the, the nature of his show and what it was about. And it just, it didn't, it didn't do it for me. I'm sure it, did, it does it for a whole lot of people, but it wasn't me. You know, so, so I haven't listened to Stapleton in a long time, but, but, but back when he was a libertarian, <laughs> did I say that out loud? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know he's a libertarian, but you know, when, when it felt like he was, that was what he was talking about. I was really into his show and I'm trying to think of how did I find peddling fiction? Was, was it advertised on part of the problem? Did it, then yeah. that was it. Then, then that ad, that ad brought me. That's exactly what happened. If it, if it was advertised on part of the problem, I was like, hmm, I'll check. Because oftentimes if Dave is advertising a podcast, I'll go listen to at least, like I'll listen to one episode. And then if I like it, I'll keep listening. And if I don't, well, then I just unsubscribe, you know? But I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, put a, I put a lot of stock apparently in what Dave says, even though I get it. I mean, he's ultimately advertising the person who's paying him. But, you know, I, I'd like to at least think that he's not gonna he's not gonna send me to some woke shit just because they were willing to write him a check, you know. Yeah. So if, if if they're advertising on on, uh, on Dave's show, I assume that it's gonna be you know at least at least something worth worthless worth giving a chance to. And and so I've listened to a couple things that he's recommended, and none of them really stuck. Although other than peddling fiction, well, yeah. it's it's funny. If I think pretty much everybody came from from the Dave Smith. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that's how I got to peddling fiction. Uh, so go. what got me started was I was listening to, I really liked Tulsi Gabbard in the uh, Democratic primaries. And she did that yeah. interview with, it was her and Joe and uh, Jocko Willick on Joe Rogan. And so I listened to that episode of Rogan. And then I just like, I sat at my office a lot and didn't do a lot other than normally I would listen to music and, and do work. And uh, I listened to that Joe Rogan show, and I was like, I'll start listening. To, I'll start listening to this a little bit more. And it was a, a Michael Malice episode, and I really liked Malice. I really yeah. liked Malice on Rogan, and so <laughs> so then I went. He's in permanent rotation for me, yeah. So then I went and checked out your You're Welcome, and and then they had one of the the Malice Dave Smith crossover episodes where they they did like the episode together. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of Dave Smith. So then, oh, I, so then I Malice went, brought you to Dave Smith. Yeah, oh, that's funny because 
Dave Smith brought me to Malice. <laughs> so, so then I went and started listening to part of the problem as well. And that's when I heard the the uh, advertisement for Peddling Fiction is like, mm -hmm. you know, I went from Rogan to Malice, from Malice to part of the problem. May as well just keep going. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I was, I, I've been a kind of late arriver to Malice. Um, I was kind of, I was aware of, I, I read his book, the, the New Right, long before I was ever listening to his podcast, you know. Um, I don't know, I don't know why I didn't get into him. Honestly, there was no particular reason. It's not like I, I, I was aware of him and I was aware he had a podcast. I can't even begin to tell you what took me so damn long. But yeah, it was definitely Dave Smith that brought me to Malice. And then, and then, uh, and then I read The New Right and I was like, Damn, that was a fantastic book. I mean, there, we need more. We need more malices, you know. We need more, more, more stuff like that. I mean, it was what a fantastic book. Somebody who's just, just unapologetic and fearless, you know. And God damn, is that refreshing, you know? So, so I really, really enjoyed the new right, and I, I just then then started listening to his podcast after that, and now it's it's it, like there's. There's a short list of podcasts that I, I I don't miss any episodes, you know, and he's one of them for sure, you know. But but yeah, part of the problem is is part of the problem has been there is no other podcast on this planet that I've listened to more episodes of, guaranteed. And like I don't even think it's close, you know, because I don't think I've missed an episode of Part of the Problem. Well, since back in the Mike Brincatelli days, you know. Uh, like that's that's I don't know how many years ago that is how long has Robbie the fire been there but it's it gets a long time it's several years for sure it's got to be four years five out of five years I have no idea but it's been a long time and yeah that's but that's how uh, I mean the spark had to be there but then you know it's it's really it's those uh, you know if you listen to part of the problem and you know Dave is always talking about about like when he criticizes the LP like his critique is like, they need to be fearless. They need to be like Ron Paul who will stand there and like say the unpopular thing and say it with a straight face and stand on it and make a solid argument and just be honest and fearless. And I think he's a hundred percent right because granted, I mean, there's nobody down there is trying to win my vote. It doesn't do them any good, right? But like, if I was down there, obviously I'd be voting for, the libertarian candidate if there's a, if there's a good libertarian candidate you know um but yeah it's like uh, you, that that's that's what brought me there oh i'm about to lose my i should not shake this <laughs> sorry um i'm talking with my hands i don't know that's that's the i'm part french and uh, talking with your hands uh <laughs> but anyways yeah that's i i i wholly agree with dave i think he's, he absolutely nails that because i I'm sorry, but like Rand Paul was never gonna win my heart and mind. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Rand Paul overall. You know, like I think Rand Paul is better than better than the bunch for sure. You know, yeah, Rand, Rand Paul, at least messaging wise, he takes the cake over every single one of the rest of them. But of of, of the rest of them, but but like, it's hard to get real fired up by Rand Paul. You know. Uh, but it was easy to get fired up by Ron Paul, you know, and 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 then yeah, listening just listening to people speak so passionately. I mean, I, I don't think like it was it was I, most of what I've read. Let me say that most of what I've read in libertarian thinking came came after I discovered part of the problem, and came from just listening to Dave just be so absolutely passionate and in love with this this view and and speak so well about it and just just break it down it, and and like kind of humbly too like you know I mean you know Dave will say like like I'm a comedian I'm a dummy and if I know this kind of stuff you know, like those kinds of things and like like make it really super approachable and I, and I, I that was fantastic you know that 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 definitely brought me into like, okay, I want to know more about this. And, and then, like, I, I read um, The Anatomy of the State after Dave said The Anatomy of the State is worth reading. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go check that out then, you know? Yeah, it's a little ridiculous just how much. But, I mean, 
I've been listening to that guy for years now. So if I didn't think he had something worth saying, I wouldn't keep listening. Right. So, yeah. and then, and then, yeah. And then it just kind of, it's only really recently that I started sort of, I mean, I guess there was Stapleton for a while and, and I still, I, you know, I don't listen to Tom Woods every day. Um, I love Tom Woods, but, but he actually puts out too much content for me. Like I, I just don't have that kind of time. So with Tom Wood, because I know I'm not going to hear them all. Now I tend to kind of cherry pick topics, you know, when he's got a topic, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I definitely want to tune into that one. I'm still subscribed. I'm still flipping through looking, you know, when I'm looking at, and, and, you know, when I'm out of my regular, my regular rotation, I'm looking for someone to listen to. He's generally the one that I'm, I'm flipping through sort of cherry picking topics, but he just, he just, I don't know. I don't know how there I'm, I'm secretly working under the theory that there's at least three Tom Woods. Somehow he found a couple do, doppelgangers. Cause there's just, there's just no way who puts out that kind of content. Like unbelievable. Like, big, who's got that kind of time. I'm a big proponent of the, the multiverse theory that there are, you know, infinite numbers of us. I think Tom went and found the ones that are the most uh, closely aligned to our universe as him and kidnapped them and brought them back. He's like three of us, we can do so much more. See, okay, it's funny the multiverse. I was just okay. I, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here, but I was thinking no, about it. I was saying no, this to a buddy of mine. We don't have that, to only talk politics. We can that, talk about that, random crazy shit too. That well, this is pretty random and crazy. But I, I, I started working on the theory recently. I, when I was hanging out with that that buddy, my Wednesday buddy, right? He's become my my COVID Wednesday buddy. Um, and I and I was saying, you know, like there's 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 a whole smattering of of worldviews out there religious or otherwise that that or you know spiritual in general that that all kind of point to the idea that you sort of create the universe that you're in you know like that that, that it's coming from you that this is that you're projecting it and it's like whether you want to you know look at that as like the law of attraction or 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 you know middle eastern philosophies or like wh whichever Whichever philosophy you, you want to look at, there's there's a handful of them that have this this the, this notion that you're creating the universe. And I, I said to my buddy, I'm like, you know, I know that can't be true. I'm like, there's no fucking way this is the universe that I create. Like, the, come on, this I every day I wake up and at some point in the day, every day of my life, the thought crosses through my mind and sometimes out of my lips. How is this the world I live in? Like how is it? Did you see the bit about the uh, the the kids show in Denmark with the man with the long penis? I did did that not approve them to make a documentary about my life, and I'm gonna have to <laughs> because like I'm not getting any I'm not getting any of the royalties from that, and I'm highly offended. <laughs> like that's awesome, <laughs> but but like seriously. I'm looking at that and I'm just like, how is this the world I live in? Like, just how is this? There is no way this is what I would create. There's, there's no way. So I can I can knock out half of the world's religions, I think, just on that that premise alone. That no, 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 no. I didn't I'm not creating this. I like, this the, is... I like the early COVID theory that uh there there's actually a uh, God's got like a seven-year-old son that uh took control of the typewriter for for this season of planet earth and you know because we got the we got a uh, a disease that came from bats and then we ran out of toilet paper we got riots for six months and like everything oh man like and where do you start australia was on fire murder hornets i didn't hear you mention murder hornets <laughs> the murder um, hornets played out so fast because uh, apparently so <laughs> I, I actually looked at the, because I'm that guy, I actually looked at the statistics on the murder hornets. And the murder hornets kill like uh, 100 people per year. And I think somebody said that the murder hornets like kill 100 people each. And so that's why murder hornets became like a big deal. Like the murder, hor murder hornets don't actually do anything. It was kind of like the, the statistics on the murder hornets were similar to the, the uh, fourth grader science project that they used to... Uh, to base the straw ban in California off of, you know, it was like the, yeah. the numbers didn't actually add up. <laughs> yeah, not just California. <laughs> we haven't actually banned straws uh, here, but I, I, it just so happens that today I went to A&W. Do you have A&W? Is it? 
I don't know. Is A and W? I don't know if that's a Canadian company or not. I have no we idea. Don't have, we don't have an A and W here. Usually, most of the places in the U.S. where there's an A and W okay. uh, restaurant, it's also tied to a uh, Long John Silver's. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I, they they've gone to paper straws, and it's like it just it's such a pet peeve of mine. Paper freaking straws, like that. Ugh. Ugh. Who does this? I can't even finish my drink without sucking up slimy straw it's uh, awful yeah. you gotta get it's you one of those metal, you gotta get you one of those metal ones that you can like carry in your pocket there is no set of circumstances under which that's happening uh, seriously like that's the world you think i'm gonna live in where i gotta carry around my own straw good god come on like it, it's nothing this is just can we just not have any fun anymore? Is that is that what we're intent well, on? Y'all aren't allowed to have guns up there, so you can use that as a weapon. Like you can sharpen up your straw and then just <laughs> was that was that a clever segue to guns? <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> you want to give us yeah. a rundown of the gun laws in? Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know where to start, eh? Um, I mean, should I just talk about the recent gun grab, or should you want me to give you kind of like a breakdown of? Like what it's like. Like you want just the overview, like yeah. the high level. This is what the rules are. Well, I mean, okay, so what, you can what actually. Happen? There, I mean, okay. First and foremost, there's absolutely no, like, there's no there's no carrying of of a sidearm ever. I mean, unless you're like a police or security or somebody who's who's got a you know special provisional license to do so. Well, that's um, my whole COVID mask strategy up because I always carry my gun. That way, if somebody's like, you need to put a mask on, I can tell them it's illegal for me to wear a mask while carrying my gun. And then they usually leave oh, immediately. Nice trick. Yeah, no, here it's very, okay. So we, we basically have just, we've divided, like, okay, you've got long guns and then you've got, nah, it's not even that. We have a because then I started thinking of all the exceptions and that gets too complicated. The bottom line is that we have, you can get a possession and acquisition license is what we call it, a PAL, right? Possession and acquisition license. And then there's a restricted possession and acquisition license or an RPAL, and that's going to be handguns and select semi-automatic guns semi-automatic rifles and there's I, I mean i guess whatever every gun ends up having to fall into some category and and so there are ones that are specifically uh, listed as as uh restricted and then we have a prohibited category that would be like your automatics anything anything fully automatic is is going to be prohibited and some of the semi-automatics so uh, most recently a, a, ar-15s there's a common misconception here Fully automatic weapons are actually illegal and have been for, God, since the early 1900s. I think it was like the 1920s or 30s. Like, fully automatic weapons have been illegal in the U.S. for almost a century. But for some reason, that's all, yeah. like, automatic weapons is always some some big uh, big gunpoint for the, the, the gun control people. But, like, fully automatic weapons yeah, have been it's... illegal for almost a century. Yeah, well, we have... I mean, there's a few people that can own prohibited weapons, firearms, I'm sorry. I mean, we never call them weapons. I just, that, 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 that slipped out because it occurred to me as soon as I said, I could hear all my Canadian gun guys, like just, just simultaneously slapping me at the back of the head. Firearms, we do not call them weapons here. We call them firearms um, because they're not, they're not, it's that, this is the point. It's not legal to use as a weapon. It's generally not legal to use even in many self-defense cases, okay? Um, there are circumstances where we do still have like a castle doctrine in Canada. So there are circumstances where you can be found not guilty because it was self-defense. If you're defending yourself from a like very real and critical danger and it's not deemed to be excessive force and blah, 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 like maybe. But you're probably going to, you know, here's the thing. Nobody loses their house because of a heart attack in Canada, but people definitely lose their house defending themselves in court for gun crimes. And law-abiding, otherwise law-abiding people. There was a story, I think it was Ontario, if I, if I recall correctly, um, where if a, long and the short of it is this guy had, and I gather this was relatively rural property, um, 
but he had some kind of running beef with his neighbor. And then he wakes up in the middle of the night, or maybe it was just late at night, either way, late at night, and three guys in masks and ski masks are throwing Molotov cocktails at his house. So he walks outside and fires a shot. He fires a shotgun into the air, like kind of a warning shot. Scares those guys off. Gets things under control. I don't know exactly how, like I, I would imagine he probably called the police. But either way, when the police discovered that he had fired this shot into the air, he was charged with gun crimes. That's against the law. You cannot, you cannot use a firearm in a threatening manner at all really like you just can't do that and apparently even if somebody's throwing molotov cocktails at your house in the middle of the night you can't do that and uh i mean in the end the good news is he won his case in the end but it seems to me it cost him like sixty thousand dollars to fight that case to keep his ass out of jail and uh he did lose his house in the process uh is there like a Canadian NRA that uh, helps people out like that? There is. There is. Um, National Firearms Association. I think it's Canadian National Firearms Association. Something like that. There, there actually is an organization. Now I kind of wish I had it off the top of my head, but just plug to them. But if there's any Canadians listening, I don't know. But anyways, yeah, they are. Uh, there, there, is, there is that. But I mean, you know, take it for what it's worth. The, the, a lot of the time what'll happen is if there's a, if there's a gun involved, this just happened in, uh, again, this was somewhere in Ontario, just happened like a few weeks back, uh, back in, I want to say November, October, November, something like that. We might've talked about this off air at one point. I don't recall, but, but um, there was a guy in a mall parking lot and he sees this guy get out of the car and then he has a small child. So I don't know how old this child was, but the child he basically puts the child into the trunk of his car, closes the, closes the lid of the trunk and goes into the mall. So this guy thinks, well, that's awfully weird and figures he's probably observing a, a kidnapping in progress, right? So he calls the police. Um, but while he's waiting for the police to show up, because you know how, you know, the old saying that when seconds count, they're there in minutes. Um, this the the this uh, we'll just call him potential kidnapper comes back out of the mall, and so this guy realizes, hey, these guys are gonna this guy's gonna get away, and like he's got a kid in his trunk, and like this, I gotta do something, and he happens to be he's a nineteen year old kid, and I, I I would imagine it sounds like he was likely a, a hunter because he had a hunting rifle with him, so he went to his car, retrieved the hunting rifle, which was almost certainly not loaded based on. I can infer that from the charges that were laid and more importantly, the charges that weren't laid. My guess is that it was not even a loaded rifle, but, and, and it would have been illegal for him to transport it loaded. So this is why I say that, like, I guess it's theoretically possible that he went to his trunk and grabbed his rifle and loaded it. But just the way our laws work in terms of transport, it's, it, it's unlikely. They, it sounds like he just grabbed his gun and had it there to, to sort of intimidate the guy and, try, and tried to get the guy to stop. Like he basically didn't want the guy to leave. And, uh, but he was unsuccessful. The guy retrieved the child out of the trunk and the child was, got back, got into the car and this guy left, but the police did show up. They did eventually track down that person. And all that was said was that, that, that guy was charged with something relating to, you know, I don't know, improper storage of a child. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whatever the, I don't know what the charge was for that guy. But he was charged with something. But the 19-year-old kid was charged with gun crimes. Because that's illegal. Carrying around an, un an unloaded gun? God. With an unloaded gun in an attempt to potentially prevent what looked very seriously, incredibly looked like a kidnapping in progress. Because who puts a kid in the trunk of their car? <laughs> right? So, I, I, I mean, if you saw that, that. But I would never actually do it. <laughs> Only with my own. <laughs> Yeah, and that was the, the police did say that that the uh, the child was known to, to the man, like so. It didn't sound like it was a parent, but you know, I don't know. Could be an uncle, could be a friend, but whatever. Either way, it was, and and really, all we had to go on on that was uh, was a police like press release, right? So you only get so much information on the press release, but 
the, uh, the either way, it was not actually a kidnapping that didn't make it right to stow a child in the trunk while you go into the mall. So that guy was charged with something, but um, yeah, but like the fact that they charged that 19 year old and now, uh, and it's serious because if you, if you're charged with a gun, first of all, as soon as you're charged with a gun crime, they take away your guns immediately. Your license is suspended, you know, and, and they take away your guns. And, and if, if uh, what you're risking is losing the, the right to ever own a gun in Canada, I mean, aside from potentially going to jail and, and, and all that stuff that goes with that, you're, you're, it's a, you're not going to be able to own a gun in Canada, you know? So yeah, it's, it's pretty serious. There's actually a really good YouTube channel. There's a guy that goes, goes by the name, uh, Runk, his, his name is Ian Runkle and his channel is called Runkle of the Bailey as an Alberta lawyer. And he's been doing just fantastic content, breaking down firearms laws and kind of like where the courts have gotten it right and where the courts have gotten it terribly wrong. And, and, uh, I mean, he's obviously a uh, strong proponent of, of, of gun ownership. And it, it, I think he's a hobby guy. Like, I think he's a hobby shooter. You know, he's, he said he's not a hunter. So I presume that his interest in guns is, is sport shooting, you know. Um, but yeah, he uh, obviously has a passion for, for firearms and, and is a lawyer. And, and he's just been putting out excellent, excellent content. But the more I watch it, the more depressing it is because our laws are just so badly, badly formed. Well, maybe once we get done with our revolution, we can come up there and uh, emancipate all of y'all. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll make uh, pancakes and maple syrup, and yes. and you guys you guys just come on up. We'll feed you a pancake breakfast, and then we can we can fix this place. I feel like it would be like uh, Napoleon trying to invade Russia. Like, we can only do it in the summer. If it gets into the winter months, we're all going back home. Fuck that. <laughs> it's probably a good call. And, and listen, we're all going to be at the beach anyways, so we won't even notice. You could come here and take this country, and we wouldn't even notice it if it's in the summertime. Come on a weekend, like a long weekend in the summer. We're, we're You can just walk right in, really. Like, we're all at the beach. That's uh, it. It's like the capital we, building, basically. Well, there's there's only, like, four weekends of summer, right? Like this is this is what summer looks like. There's like four weekends of summer, maybe maybe okay, maybe eight. But like it's it goes by so fast. You got to take know? advantage of it while it's here before you are back to hockey weather, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. No hockey weather under normal circumstances. Now we arrest people if they go play hockey. So yeah. yeah. Fortunately, I don't live in one of those parts of the country, huh? I feel like I would probably already be in jail if not dead. Like I'm, I'm not the uh, go along with it type. Yeah, well, there was the, you know, there's been a couple, I mean, like, look, not that I've been okay with any of this. I have not been okay with any of this, you know, um, especially given that at this point, it is unequivocally clear that the lockdowns cause more harm than they help. And then it's just, I don't even think anybody can argue that with a straight face at this point. And yet we're still doing it. So like, it's just, it's maddening. But I had said back in the spring, like when this all was happening in March and April, like this was coming up towards cottage season, like realistically, it's sometime in May is when I can realistically start to get out to my cottage because that's how long it takes before, like, you know, that it's like, like before, the, before there's no frost anymore, let's say that, you know? Like we're, we're well into May before there's no frost. So um, coming up to May, I, I was saying like, like, okay, whatever. You guys have your lockdowns. You do whatever you're going to do. But if, if anybody tries to tell me that I can't go to my cottage this summer, like that's a bridge too far. Like that's just, no, I'm not. I, I, I made it like I was quite vocal about the fact that, that you can say that, but you're going to have to take me away in cuffs. Like that, that's when you'll see me on the six o'clock news because I don't care. You can put any edict you want, but I, you're not going to stop me from going to my cottage because there is no rational reason why it would be bad from a COVID perspective for me to leave the city and go to my cottage where I don't interact with anybody, you know, and I'm nowhere near anybody. Right. So, so like, like that's clearly just, like I said, it's a bridge too far. The other thing that I feel the same way about is curfew. We, we, the Quebec has a curfew right now. If you're out at, if, if you're out after eight o'clock, you're, uh, you're, you're, 
you're going to, you're going to have a problem. And, and, and then they had the nerve to say, somebody asked them, well, what about homeless people? And they, they had the nerve to say homeless people should be finding indoor places to be after eight o'clock. That, that was the answer. And it's like, are you, that is, that's like a psychopath answer. Like, are you serious? Like what, do you think that they're homeless because they just didn't realize that there was an inside they could go to? Yeah, yeah. Is that what you thought the problem was? They just never thought about inside as an option? It's, <laughs> like, inside, Jesus. Inside doesn't exist. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, like what a stupid thing to say. That like, well, what about the homeless people? Well, they should they should find indoor places to be. It, the, yeah. The homeless people have to find indoor places to be, but if you want to go to a restaurant to eat, you have to sit outdoors. Well, we don't even have that. There's no no pat no no patio dining no absolutely not no you can't gather anywhere there's no gather there's no every restaurant the restaurants that are open are open only for delivery and pickup that's it like like and 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 so there's a lot of restaurants that are just not open because the small the smaller like mom and pop kind of places they don't have a big enough following to to support the the like dine in and takeout alone right. This, so this thing has completely shuttered small businesses and a lot of them oh, probably forever. And the people who them are now bankrupt and homeless and like it is the, uh, yeah, the cure has definitely been way worse than the, the disease ever would have been. Sorry. There's a, there's a dog that just came and joined me and I, I can't pass up the opportunity to give a little, a little love into this puppy here. <laughs> she's, a, she's amazing. This is a 16-year-old black lab here. And uh, you want to see her? Sure. I'm going to take you here. This is Penny. We're going to make Penny. A, well, Penny's already a YouTube star. She has her own channel. Oh, wow. So she, yeah. she's, gonna, she's going to be the most popular part of this entire interview. Oh, well, she always is. She always is. She's a 16-year-old black lab, and she's amazing. If I tell my wife that they're not my dog. the interview, she'll watch the whole thing. Like, she's there you go. She's never watched a single one of my podcasts, but if I tell her there's a dog on it, she will watch the whole thing just to see the dog. Is, is she political at all? My wife? Yeah. Um, sort of. She, yeah. so when we first got together, she was pretty leftist. And the, the longer we've been together, I've kind of rubbed off on her a little bit. Uh, and also... She's gotten a pretty good job now and makes really good money. And when she sees that changes a person, <laughs> when she sees the taxes come out of her check every other week, she just gets so pissed off. Like it's uh, they've they have successfully made her into a full blown ANCAP just just off the tax nice. alone. <laughs> my my gal is is very like apolitical. She she's bored by it. She doesn't care. She doesn't want to hear about it. Mostly, you know, she did when, when, uh, when you guys were having your little, um, insurrection light that happened on Wednesday, um, whatever you want to call that, um, uh, I was calling her into the room. That was that, cosplay at the Capitol is what I'm calling it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the, exactly. When they, when, the, when those guys were LARPing at the Capitol building, um, that, that, uh, I was calling her into the wall because we, you know, well, we were streaming it together there for big chunks of the day and. And I was calling her into the room and saying, like, you got to see this. And so she came and sat and watched some of it with some some interest and amusement, for sure, because it was so unusual, but, and so, like, unexpected, you know? Right. But, uh, but yeah, in general, no, she, uh, she has no interest in politics and certainly not in economics. And, like, that's just my nerd shit. And she leaves me to be with that. And, you know, that's kind of a good thing in a lot of ways. You know, because I got to tell you, if I was with somebody who thought like me, there'd be no escape. Like, there'd be no turning it off, right? Like, like she and I can hang out and watch some TV. And, 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 and most of the time, I do my best to not, not sort of go off on, on, like, libertarian rants. But it's, it's hard, man, because so much content is just so, like, woke-obsessed now, you know? It's just it's just draining to, to to virtue signal and and there's times where we'll be watching some show and I'm just like okay I just can't take this anymore you know. So we'll talk about stuff quite a bit, but not like excessively. And and I'll have my little rants and uh, she'll 
she'll listen and she'll agree with me and and then we'll move on and like we you know we do a lot of other stuff i do way too much that's uh politically based uh, obviously as we've as we've talked about before like i'm i'm uh all up to my eyeballs and all of this shit and so like i'll i'll kind of vent and tell her about stuff from time to time but and and she'll amuse or uh she'll entertain herself with listening to me for a little bit but she she doesn't want to hear about it all the time yeah. well that, that's you know what don't 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 let that go let let her keep like let her keep it at arm's length because i'm telling you <laughs> it's nice to have somebody that's important to you in your life that you can sit and not talk about politics and not talk about culture and not talk about economics and not talk, you know just like because i mean well you know what it's like like when you once you start to understand how liberty works and then you like once you once you get red pilled it's you see it everywhere all you, you it's everywhere know. around you you're you're and, and and it's like it's like every direction you look everything is wrong like it's so disheartening i you know it's funny because i'm i'm you know malice's whole white pill black pill thing right and uh god damn i i am not by nature i am not a pessimistic person i'm really really not i'm i've always said like i'm kind of the eternal optimist you know like that's just my nature but it is getting hard to keep the pill white you know like like it really it's like i just like how do, how does this play out in a way that isn't horrible? I don't know. I just can't. What's the way home from this? You know, like I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. Well, I, I, I I'm increasingly convinced that the divide. You know, there 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 is such a thing as irreconcilable differences. There really is. And I think, and yeah, I, I yeah. Doesn't it seem like this this is where we are? It's just irreconcilable differences. You know, and. I don't know. I mean, to me, this, this is why, you know, my, my ideal is buying something like, you know, 80 or a hundred acres. My ideal is 80 or a hundred acres with lots of trees, good bit of field, water access. That's it. That's all I want, you know, and Probably someplace where my, my, ignore all of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then just you know what? Like I'll be perfectly happy keeping a homestead somewhere. I, I you know what I do? Oh, you know Owen Jim, Owen Benjamin? No. No, you don't okay. So Owen Benjamin, yeah, so he, he probably got depersoned before you started tuning into uh part of the problem then. Because I came to know Owen Benjamin because Owen's like buddies with Dave. And person, Owen's person, they, they didn't deplatform him, they completely removed his personhood. They just depersoned him, yeah. He just doesn't exist now. Um, he uh, yeah, he was I booted off of Twitter, obviously. Um, he, as I recall correctly, if I, if I remember the, 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 the drama about it, he, he was booted off of Twitter because he suggested that um, transitioning a six year old. Giving a six-year-old drugs, puberty-blocking drugs to transis to to transition them, was child abuse. That was what he said. That was the that was the cardinal sin that got him booted off of Twitter, as I recall. Because you can't say that in uh, polite company. But yeah, so so but o Owen Benjamin, I mean, he's a comedian. He's you know he's he's a quite a good comedian, and uh, and and just a really super guy. From what I can tell, it, it, my impression of him, I mean, it's like not like I know the guy, not like I've ever met the guy, but my impression of him is that he's just a super guy. But yeah, he basically bought land and he's got goats now and he's raising his, he's homeschooling his kids. He's got young kids, he's homeschooling. And he just said, you know what, this, this world is stupid. I'm just going to go live on, live on a farm and, and good for him. You know? I want goats. Yeah. I'm beyond the age of having young kids to raise. So I don't even have to worry about that, that particular challenge. So, uh, I, could, I could do a rural life. I could definitely do a rural life. That would be, uh, I think that's in the cards. If you feel like kids, I'll send you mine. You can, uh, you can borrow them for a while. Well, they fit in a trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried yet. I don't know. I drive a truck. So. 
to, to, do they fit? I mean, I guess what I need to know is do they fit in this, like the trunk of a mid-sized four-door sedan? That's what I need to know. <laughs> well, I think we've uh, just about gone for a hour and a half, maybe longer than that. I don't know. This thing doesn't have a I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. What, exactly. I don't have a clock. But I, I think I do have the solution to both of our problems. Uh, we need to we need to follow Johnny's lead and all just run away to Mexico. Yeah, well, that's kind of part of the plan, eh? That's like my uh, my Trailer Park Boys. Do you have you ever seen Trailer Park Boys? Does that mean something to you? Okay, I didn't I, I was I didn't know if that, that was going to be a thing or not. Um, but uh, that was sort of my Trailer Park Boys Freedom Forty Five plan is. Uh, is to live half the year on a homestead in the wilderness and half the year in Mexico, because the homestead sounds nice, but Canadian winters still suck. And and I got to tell you, January is much nicer in in Mexico than it is in Manitoba. I'm not even a fan of Indiana winters, so let's let's do it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, we'll there you go. Right we'll definitely have to do this again next time. Next time we won't talk politics at all. I need you to watch like all nine seasons of Letter Kenny, and then we're just going to break down Letter Kenny and talk about how that compares to actual life in Canada. What's it on? Ah, I can find out. I'll find, I, Hulu. I, I don't get Hulu. And and y'all's channels or y'all's stuff is like Canadian Netflix and Canadian Hulu are different from American Netflix and Hulu. So I don't know. Well, is there even a Canadian Hulu? I seems to me like I had Hulu way back when. Um, when, when I had like the, the, you know, DNS spoofing going on, uh, so I could pick up the American Netflix and then I could also pick up the, the, uh, I could, I could pick up Hulu and that was, that was working out great. But then Netflix, I think got pressured by the Canadian government and, uh, and they eventually started cracking down on, on the DNS spoofing and made that not work or made, you know, it would work for a while and then they, then it would stop working and it was just too big of a pain in the ass. I gave up on it. But then I also lost Hulu along the way. So I don't know. I guess that's, uh, I'll find it. The internet's a big place. I'll find it. I was going to say, there was, a, there was a channel that it was on other than Hulu. But now, for the life of me, I can't remember. And I can't find it because for as much as I do on the internet, I actually kind of suck at using the internet. huh? <laughs> well, I'll find it. I'll find it, yeah. Yeah, you there find you it next time we're we're gonna just review all nine seasons of the letter, Kenny. I'm a I'm gonna go. wife watch it. She hates it, absolutely hates it. Like she she does not think it's funny at all. And I think it's the most hilarious thing ever. So maybe you'll agree with one of us or find it somewhere in between. I took I took way too long to warm up to trailer park boys. For the longest time I was like, This is a stupid show. And 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 I just like you know, and then you know what it is? Lockdown, eh? That's literally... I, I only watch Trailer Park Boys for the first time, really, this year. Just, like, you, eventually you just run out of shit, and it's like, okay, fine, lots of people seem to like this. I'm gonna watch it, and then eventually it it, it won me over. It, it definitely won me over, so we'll see. This is a good time to introduce me to a show, because there's so little going on. I'm probably hey. gonna... And they're 30-minute uh, uh, episodes, so you can rack through them quick. Uh, I'll, I'll be a lot easier on it right now. The bar is a lot lower for my uh, for my content consumption right now. So, all right. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you for coming on. And Happy thank you it. for listening. And I'll be back later in the week. I don't know if it'll be a solo episode or another interview. I'm still trying to work out the details on that. But in the meantime, have a good day and I will catch you later. <laughs>